Welcome back friends. In this video tutorial we are also talking about the mode of action of different protein synthesis inhibitors or antibiotics. Now we have uh, individually discussed about the 50S ribosomal subunit inhibitors. We have talked about 30S ribosomal subunit inhibitors. Now in this video we are going to see the 70S ribosome inhibitor because we are talking about bacterial uh, antibiotic. So those antibiotics are targeting bacterial cells to kill. Now 70S is the ribosome for bacteria or prokaryotic cells. So in those cases 70S ribosome inhibitor is our goal of interest. Okay. Now 70S ribosome is not a subunit. It is a compiled version of ribosome. So we are having 50S and 30S all together. When they are arranged together we call it a 70S ribosome. Now this whole ribosome assembly can be halted or can be prevented due to the activity of the 70s ribosome inhibitors. And the example of the 70s ribosome inhibitors are uh, aminoglycosides. The group is called aminoglycosides. Aminoglycosides. Okay. And the example for that, there are a lot of examples. Remember I have told you before that uh, we always write is as uh, mycene. So let, let me write is as... Uh, streptomycin streptomycin neomycin gentamycin then we are having many different varieties here streptomycin neomycin gentamycin so this scene or mycin is at the end is a kind of formulation for remembering all the names gentamicin, neomycin, streptomycin and all these different antibiotics all of them are the part of aminoglycosides and these aminoglycosides are attacking the whole assembled ribosome complex okay now the 70s ribosome inhibitors they interact with the translation process or protein synthesis process in two different uh, stages one is the beginning of the protein synthesis and the one is the ending of the protein synthesis. So for the understanding of their mechanism of action what you need to do you need to understand the initiation of a translation or protein synthesis and termination of protein synthesis a little bit. And we, we have already seen uh, this 50S and 30S subunit inhibitors interfering with the middle point of the protein synthesis or the peptide chain formation and translocation phases of protein synthesis right or elongation of the protein synthesis. But this 70s inhibitors interfere with the start and the end of the protein synthesis. Now in this case, the very beginning of protein synthesis occurs just like that. So we are having 30s subunit first. Now this 30s subunit usually binds with the ribosome. It binds with the ribosome. Now there is a complementary pairing between the rRNA present in the 30s subunit and the mRNA. Now due to this interaction, they bind with this region. So this mRNA and 30s ribosome complex is the pre-initiation complex so it's, it's 30s this is called the pre-initiation complex of translation after that this 30s subunit remember it is having three different sections one is the e then p then a three different sites and among these three different sites in this a site portion there is a important protein that binds with this region and that this uh, sorry, actually in the P side there is a protein that I usually bind with and the protein is termed as a release factor. That release factor binds with this P side usually here, right? And that is preventing the binding of the 50S subunit to this place. Okay, now release factor is binding there. It is preventing the 50S subunit to come and attach with it randomly. Now, once when the charged tRNA will be in place, once the charge, the first charge tRNA will come in and placed here, right? Uh, sorry, I made a mistake there. Now, usually the release factor bind with this A site, not P site, sorry. So, usually the release factor bind with this A site region somewhere. Now, it is preventing the binding of 50S subunit. Now, once the charge tRNA, remember the first charge tRNA usually placed in the P site, not the A site. So, first charge tRNA, so if I draw it here, first charge tRNA usually placed in the P site, not the A side because A side is already blocked by the release factor, right? So first tRNA binds. After the binding of first tRNA, this release factor will be released. So it this factor will be released. After releasing this release factor, then the 50s subunit will come and attach to this place. Then the 50s subunit come, you know, it attaches. Now again, 50s subunit is also having those three regions, E, P, and A, three different sites. 
Now as we can see, now we are having our first tRNA sitting onto the P site, E site is free, A site is free and now another tRNA will come to the A site and that's how they will start uh, adding the tRNA and start adding the amino acid carried by the tRNA. For example, here this first tRNA carries this amino acid. And in case of prokaryotic system, the first tRNA, the amino acid, the first tRNA carries methionine. It is called FMET or formylated methionine. It's a modified version of methionine. It's usually going to be always that the first uh, amino acid that is to be added in protein chain in prokaryotic system. So they bring it and sit onto it. Then the rest of them will come. Now this part is very very important. Remember, so to regulate, uh, the, to prevent the random binding of 30th, 50th subunit of a ribosome, there is a release factor bind with A side which is preventing the binding of 30th and 50th complex. Now once it, the, once a charged tRNA uh, placed in P site, the factor releases 50s and 30s combined with each other. Now what we get 30s mRNA and a 50s complete 70s ribosome with mRNA. This complex is called as translation initiation complex. Initiation complex, and then they start the protein synthesis. Okay. So that's the protein synthesis. Remember when we talked first that mRNA with 30 subunit only called as pre-initiation complex. But now it is converted into initiation complex and it will begin the translation process. Okay. Now this is very important. Right. Now why? Because during this process, this aminoglycosides like streptomycin, gentamicin, neomycin, this antibiotic will come and bind with this 30th subunit at the very beginning of this assembly of total 70s ribosome. So before the assembly and formation of initiation complex, this antibiotic will come and bind with the 30th A site. After the result of this binding, it will permanently hold this release factor to this A site. Now as it is permanently blocking this A site, no further amino acid will come. And as a result, this release factor binds to it, 50th subunit will not get a chance to pair with 30th subunit. So they are blocking the formation of 70th ribosome. Right, so they are interfering with this place. So we can say if the antibiotic go, so this is the antibiotic, it go just sit onto this place. As a result, it modifies the 30s in such a way it prevents it prevents formation prevents the formation of 70s ribosome complex prevents the formation of 70s ribosome complex, and as a result of that translation cannot begin. So it blocks the translation at the very beginning, very first phase. It is the initiation phase of translation. Now it can also block, so this is at the very first or initiation, initiation blockage, right? It can also block this same thing at the termination also. It can block the trans termination of a uh, protein synthesis also. How? During the termination what, what is going on that mRNA is there. So let, so let me draw the termination part. So if this is suppose this is the mRNA and here we are having the 30s and a 50s like that. Let me draw 50s, 30s. It is having their own regions of EPNA site. right? And it is having the tRNA sitting here at this P site. Let's say here and it is containing the large polypeptide chain. So let's say this is the polypeptide chain that it produces. It produces a long polypeptide chain. And at this site of mRNA, there is a stop codon. Stop codon means, you know, UAA, UGA, and UAA, UGA, and another. There are three different... Uh, stop codon uh, present there. So this stop codon, when they find this kind of codon in mRNA, in those cases they will bring a release factor. Instead of binding, or instead of providing the tRNA for that, it brings a release factor. Now that release factor will come, a termination factor will come and sit onto this anticodon. Now this termination factor is having two different domains. So if I draw the termination factor here with this uh, black color, it is having two domains as you can see. One domain uh, is uh, the anticodon domain which will be attached to this complementary stop codon. Another domain here is the hydrolytic domain. So if I, I, the, the structure I have drawn is something like that. This is the hydrolytic domain. 
and this is the anticodon right now it recognizes the stop codon here and binds with it but this hydrolytic domain also senses uh, the polypeptide chain formed from this tRNA present at the P site so this hydrolytic enzyme will help to hydrolyze the bond here the peptide bond and as a result it will cleave it and after cleaving of it it will generate the polypeptide chain so let's see this is the polypeptide chain or so let me write polypeptide it will develop this polypeptide chain right so protein is made that's the usual process right now during this process of uh, activity by aminoglycosides what they can do is that they can inhibit the binding of this release factor at this site they inhibit the binding of release factor now as a result of the alteration of ribosome or due to somehow they inhibit the binding of this release factor by sitting onto this a site it is also jamming the attachment of this release factor at this place right so it is inhibiting this release factor to come and sit onto this region to inhibit the process so even after it reaches the stop codon even after the whole protein synthesis is done it blocks the release of the matured polypeptide chain from the ribosome so it just stays there as it is even everything is done all the polypeptide chain required chain is produced but still due to the non due to the you know, absent of this uh, release factor it is no longer able to cleave the chain it is no longer able to release the polypeptide chain so as a result it will be staying as it is so the protein as the as as the protein synthesis is completed but still the termination is halted as a result uh, we don't get any protein we get proteins like this and it, it, during this protein synthesis inside the cell we are having lots of polypeptide chain coming out like that usually they are uh, they are degraded by cellular machineries other kind of machinery so we don't get any protein at this place so in both these cases as you can see in the first case we block it in initiation by attachment to the a site in this case also we see the blockage by attachment to the a site in the first case it is helping the release of uh, it, it is blocking the release of the release factor and in the second case it is helping the attachment uh, it is blocking the attachment of the release factor right so in both this case it is interfering with the functionality of release factor uh, binding with the a site right so that is preventing them for the synthesis of proteins so for that reason the 70s ribosome inhibitors are kind of deadly for bacteria but most of the time they are having a bacteriostatic effect because we are talking about protein synthesis so except for protein synthesis bacteria can survive for some period of time but after that if the blocks the protein synthesis or synthesis of those protein which are required constitutively inside the cell the cell will die if we administer the antibiotic for longer period of time okay so that's the process of how these uh, inhibitors will play uh, the role in this case okay and i hope that's helpful helpful thank you